Old School Lane Casual Chat is brought to you by Old School Lane, producing various content from blogs, videos, and podcasts discussing about movies, TV shows, video games, and everything else in between since 2011. You can check out the podcast on Anchor, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Radio Public, Overcast, Breaker, Pocket Cast, and YouTube. We're associated with Channel Frederator, Manic Expression, The Comic Book Cast, and The Aaron Meta Show. <laughs> go hello right. everyone and welcome to the first episode of casual chats for 2023 i'm patricia i'm here with these two amazing special guests uh, today as of the recording of this podcast is february 1st 2023 it is the 15th anniversary of phineas and ferb and i have with me the wonderfully and talented martin and olivia olson so welcome guys oh yeah hello patricia thank you for having us Absolutely. So can you believe it? Been 15 years since Phineas and Ferb. Absolutely oh my God. I'm not. ready for the grave. I should just dig a grave right here. <laughs> well, uh, also, well, you, should, you should welcome uh, Juice into the conversation. He's the doggy behind Olivia. <laughs> Juice. Juice, how are you? Hi, Juice. How are you doing? <laughs> yeah. So 15 years. I was 15 years old when we started working on it. Wow. So that's been half of my life. That's incredible. Actually, has been dedicated to to Disney, Dan, and Swampy. <laughs> I remember what happened. Dan and Swampy said, "Look, we have the show," and they called me up, or Swampy called me up from England. Did I tell you this, Patricia? Um, I think you briefly did, but for maybe uh, we I've been having a lot of new listeners since the uh, the last time that sure. we spoke. So if you can, please uh, share the story for the new listeners. Well, just briefly. He Swampy called out of the blue. He and I and Dan had worked together on Rocco's Modern Life t 10 years before or something. Yeah. And he said, hey, Martin, this, we really like working with you on on uh, <clears throat> before. And we just got optioned a show for Disney. We don't think it's going to go because it's not a Disney show at all. But we wanted to know if you'd come in with us as a, as a head writer or something. So then when suddenly they, it was greenlit, mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, we were amazed And the next, because it wasn't a Disney show at all. <laughs> and then, um, then uh, I think it was Dan, I can't remember, it might've been Swamp, but he said, hey, wait a minute, maybe Olivia could come in. So after uh, Doofenshmirtz had an assistant, which was a girl, one of them suggested, hey, because Olivia was in Love Actually. And I said, what's Olivia doing? Just think she'd like to be on the show because she could also sing. So that's really how it happened. It was their idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you guys started pumping out so many songs in the beginning that every time there was a, like a female vocal part that needed demoing, I was doing all of the song demos. And so it just, that kind of sparked it too, in a sense of, hey, well, maybe she could come in and try out for part of Vanessa because her singing's pretty good. <laughs> Patricia was really a, a perfect storm of goodness. Yeah. Because they knew Olivia when she was a baby. And then Olivia made it on her own as a as a world known singer <laughs> as a kid. 
Yes. And then they said, well, she should come in. And then Dan said, well, she could play my daughter. So yeah. it's funny how it all works out by itself, kind of. Yeah, absolutely. It's just um, moments that you have the right elements just there. And then it just mm -hmm. all compiles together into something that you didn't expect to be as a hit as it was. I remember when people were saying about how Phineas and Ferb was able to get back to basics with its storytelling and its characters and its music that it kind of like rejuvenated people's interest to kind of tune into what was going on in the Disney Channel. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, because I remember from <clears throat> a few friends of mine when they would say that around the late 2000s or something like that, that animation was going through a bit of um, a bumpy road. Um, I'm sure that uh, some people can be able to go in more in detail, but mm -hmm. there was just some things that were going up and down, especially with the industry, like the writer's strike, and then right. there was a lot of controversy. Yeah, that was around then. Yeah. yeah. Then there was also a lot of controversies with um, a lot of people from various networks having to leave because of a lot of things happening. So a lot of people started changing around with management. And oh. so I think that it was kind of like that right moment where yeah. Dan and Swampy were able to bring their ideas together. And it was like perfect timing considering that they actually pitched this around when Rocco was out and, you know, they pitched it to multiple networks and they wanted to see if anybody would pick them up, but it just didn't for happen. Years. But, yeah, yeah. For years. But it just goes to show you that it's never too late. If you have a good idea, you just have to wait for when the right moment hits. Or it's always too late because we'll all be dead soon. <laughs> that too. <laughs> I mean, that's the prize. What kind of a life is that? Mm, that's true. I mean, no matter where we end up in life, we're all going to the same place at the end. Hopefully. But what a ride. <laughs> so it was fun that um, Olivia, our adopted daughter, mm -hmm. adopted at birth, along with my son Casey, was adopted at birth. Mm -hmm. turned out to be a genius you know yeah it's a weird coincidence <laughs> well it's it's really cool it's really cool now of like getting to play dan's daughter and then obviously working with my dad on the show and then like going on to play all of these like daughters of like wacky crazy characters and now dan's working with his daughter on him i know like, yeah i've heard about that that's great i mean and I think that it's kind of an interesting thing that you were mentioning earlier about like working with your dad, because when your dad was in the podcast last time, we were talking about not only when uh, you were brought in for Phineas and Fur, but you were also brought in for Adventure Time. And I even mentioned in the podcast how when your dad was very hesitant on playing um, Marceline's dad in Adventure Time, yeah, I, I told him, I reminded him the story about how he tried to convince Jill Murray to play as Ralph Bighead. <laughs> <Rocco>. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Some so parts are just made for people, you know? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. I forgot about that, Patricia. That was a really good point you made. <clears throat> yeah, I just, it just came serendipitous. It, it just came like a serendipitous in my head, especially a few mm. years ago when I taught, when I interviewed Joe on my podcast. So I, I just thought it was like really interesting about how this guy who said, I'm an animator, I'm not an actor. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can play this guy <laughs> who is a cartoonist who hates his parents because <laughs> they want him to be a cartoonist. They wanted him to work in this company. So it's it's kind of like, um, should I play the what is essentially the guy who's in charge of <laughs> down below? <laughs> would I be a part of this? Would 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 I fit? I don't know. I'm all right. <laughs> Even the dog. After Even the dog agrees. Written a, written a book in that same perspective. Exactly, of, yeah. So. yeah. Doggies, juice. Exactly. Even the dogs agree with my sentiment. <laughs> That's well, when life imitates art, you know? It does, it does. Uh, anyway, so I guess while we're on the subject of Phineas and Ferb, now tell us um, for you, Martin, so what was the writing process like with yourself and Dan Swampy and all the other writers? It was a, a, a board-driven show, which means there were no scripts. Mm. And it, uh, similar to Rocco's Modern Life, there were no scripts. Juicy. Juicy. 
So they wanted to do board driven shows, which has a different quality of humor than scripted shows. It's more organic and more visual by definition because no scripts. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so we would just all meet together. We writers would come up with, uh, I don't know, 20 story ideas a week or something. And we'd pass in about 10. <clears throat> Uh, and then, uh, then Dana Swampy would go through them, and we'd have a big meeting, and everyone would either laugh or or hate it, hate it. <laughs> and then they'd assign which ones to do, and then we would do we would expand those little paragraphs to about a page and a half with a beginning and a middle and an end. Mm -hmm. and, um, <clears throat> then the board people, who were also writers on the show as legit writers as 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 us they would write all the dialogue and they would take those that page and a half or two pages of a story and turn it into a 10 minute episode mm -hmm. now would that be the same process for the music as well no the music is totally different <laughs> music was Sorry. dan and swampy and i were all songwriters Mm -hmm. So, and John Colton Barry was a songwriter. So, uh, Disney didn't pay us to write the songs. So, we had to write on our spare time. <laughs> we had to get together and we soon like found out the on Fridays. <laughs> after yeah. You should be going home. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we would write them after work around six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock. And but we found out soon that it only takes an hour to write a song. Mm -hmm. So uh I mean a basic song with the lyrics and the melody and the chords. So we would refine them later, but that's all it took. And so we would sometimes have the other artists come in if they were proposing a song. If the board guys were proposing a song, we'd work together with them. But it was generally me, Dan and Swampy, and John Colton Barry, and Rob Hughes, who was the storyboard director and also producer in the last couple seasons, was also a songwriter. Mm -hmm. And it just was the right team. It was so perfect for songwriting. So the songs became so popular that some celebrities or famous people who had kids that age reached out to Disney saying, who's writing the songs for this? Like Slash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so then a number of people came in and wrote songs with us. Famous people. Yeah. So it just was a, a lucky combo of things. But I think lucky isn't, lucky of course is is the ruling factor, but it all goes down to Dan and Swampy being super good guys. Mm -hmm. So without that, without them being willing to take ideas from anybody in the in the crew um, and sharing the songwriting uh, uh, credits with, with whoever was in the room at the time who contributed, um, it's really because they were they were uh, the perfect team for making a hit show. Yeah. You know. uh, speaking of celebrities and music, I'm sure you probably know this from watching Dan's Instagram or his TikTok, but people oh. such as Jimmy Fallon and Reese Witherspoon <laughs> dance to squirrels in my pants. Yeah. That's crazy. Both Dan and Swampy send me all those things. Yeah. <laughs> he always, every time a big name does something Phineas related, he's like, did you see this? Did you see this? Did you see this? <laughs> He just sent me the TikTok that you were uh, telling me about um, with the the cat wiki photos. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Oh, you had the world's worst wiki photo. Yeah, but at least I'm not alone in it. <laughs> yeah, you and Dan were both about to sneeze in yours. <clears throat> I don't know who was in charge of putting up the wiki photos, but. Uh... <laughs> I think it's time for a change. <laughs> he, he, he stitched uh, someone's video that was like, I am the guy whose job it is to find the worst photo possible of someone. <laughs> He's like, are you a handsome 
leading actor, here's that bad hat you wore in 2007. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. or, or even worse yet, here's a celebrity and it's not the actual celebrity. It's somebody else oh. who looks like the celebrity. No and way, did that happen? Like, I've heard some yeah. stories about that. Like the, the impersonator was so good that they thought it was that person. I think I've heard like maybe one or two cases like that. But yeah, I, I just find that to be hilarious. Oh, you guys, I got a story for you. A quick one. Oh, yeah. So go for it. So I was at, it's related to that. I was at uh, Musso and Frank's, which is a marvelous classic restaurant in Los Angeles. I think the oldest restaurant. Yeah. And a buddy of mine who was a comedian who did a spot on, and he actually looked like him, impression of Steve Martin, happened to be there when I was being interviewed for a gig. And so I saw him. I said, hey, would you do me a favor? Come on over as Steve. Do it full throttle and come over to our table and, and introduce, you know, be real friendly with me and I'll introduce them. It'll be a thrill for them. And so, and I knew the old gag of uh, 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 the gag of how to how to re reverse that. And so he came over about you know twenty minutes later when we were all talking heavy duty, and he said Martin, and he was doing a Steve Martin shtick and everything like that. And I said, Hey Steve, we're busy talking. Do you mind? And then he just went slumped down and he walked away. <laughs> so they thought that it really was Steve Martin. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and I was putting him down. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> of all people. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Uh, there was, I think, the, the most um, interesting time that I've ever met a celebrity, it was uh, during an event in Florida called Sunfest, where like a whole bunch of um, artists and musicians come by to perform in Florida. And there was one time in which I was at a Barnes & Noble, which was like really close by to where the event was holding. And right by the book section where there's like a bunch of... Um, like interesting oddities about Syria, Syria uh, su subjects. And yeah. I was just like looking at this guy with like long hair and I recognized him and he said, are you Steven Tyler? And he Get said, out. no, I'm not joking. Wow. Yeah. He, yeah. It was Steven Tyler from Aerosmith. And wow. <laughs> yeah. I just so happened to meet him at a Barnes and Noble at a oddities book section. And <laughs> Oh, that's right. was he nice? Yeah, he was. He was pretty cool. He didn't want anybody to actually know that he was there. Oh, he would have been yeah. mobbed, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, I had a book in my hand. It had nothing to do with music, and he just autographed it. And then he <laughs> just do you remember what book it was. was it yes, like totally it was like some self help book or something. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you just grabbed it. I was just holding on to it for a oh. read, and then he just, um, you know, grabbed it, and then he was like, he autographed it for me, and then <laughs> I ended up buying the book anyway because of course. why not? <laughs> so yeah. I have it, I have it somewhere in my bookshelf. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, that's good to hear when people are good guys about stuff. But then also, it's a fifty-fifty relationship. You're a really nice person, super smart. So if you were a jerk, he wouldn't have done that. Oh, <laughs> no, no, of course not. <laughs> no, I, I didn't really, I wasn't really that squealy, to be quite honest. I was just like, <laughs> you look familiar. I was more like that. It was just kind of interesting that he would show up in a Barnes and Noble out of all places. I guess maybe he just needed to lay low for a little bit. I just thought it was interesting. In Florida. In Florida, Yeah. <laughs> It made sense because he was performing, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was a huge venue that was happening. Anyway, so where are we talking about? Oh, yeah, music. So I'd like to know from you guys, what have been your favorite songs from Phineas and Ferb? Olivia? Um, I think just because it's so, so Phineas is when um, they did the caveman version of the Gitchy Gitchy <laughs> song. <laughs> yeah it was super fun i think I that think was swampy's idea like like just like rehashed the same idea like over and over and over is always the funniest gags to me in the show mm -hmm. yeah it, the show turned into be a weird satire on making a show on itself you know it was weird yeah. it turned out because the every story was basically the same with the same structure 
it became a paradise for satire of storytelling itself, you know? Yeah, on itself. The story was always the same, so then we had to make weird permutations of it after four seasons, you know? Yeah. Some people didn't get it. Some people that don't aren't attuned to satire, they just didn't, that's not their thing. So some people complained that, hey, if every story is the same, that was the joke. That was what was funny, but not funny to some people for some reason. I, some I can... people really felt for Candace. Cause... <laughs> oh my God. We, can't... we were so lucky to get Ashley, the funniest actor at Disney. Yeah. She, she, she was so without an ego and so talented that she would, she would literally do make herself look like an idiot on I mean she was so funny mm -hmm. and such a such a wonderful person to work with that we were so lucky to get her because mm -hmm. she was the best character in the show <clears throat> aside from you of course <laughs> yeah now we're just waiting for your movie <laughs> we had Candace against the universe now we need <laughs> Vanessa, Vanessa against, against yeah we need Vanessa against the galaxy <laughs> <laughs> well, I was so excited that I had such a big part um, in this latest film because yeah. in the first one in Across the Second Dimension, the runtime of the of the movie was like 15 or 20 minutes too long. And the only way that they could shorten it, they cut my entire part out. Oh, they no. cut your entire B story out. That's right. And we had a good song in there, too. It was the only part that like didn't affect the major story. What was the song? I'm actually curious. I forget, but I remember the scene was on the roof outside of a window, Olivia, with you and Doof, was it? Um, Where he was it was a heart to heart about My song still made it. Um they still did the the I walk away, the Perry song. Oh, oh okay. I think they just reworked it to be like a different sequence rather than have it being Vanessa singing it or something yeah okay I see yeah I think so that it, um one of the things enough, that I oh go ahead I'm sorry oh uh, no I'm sorry I interrupted you no I was just going to say that one of the things that I really enjoyed about the movies was that it was able to elevate the stories and the characters in a way that we you weren't able to get it in like 11 minutes and mm -hmm. some of the stuff that you would come up with was just absolutely insane but it fits so well with the show that it just made it a fun thing to watch once again we luck we were lucky because dan and swampy are both super savvy with songwriting and i mean dan led the songwriting sessions so he basically set the tone <clears throat> which is it, just a, a tribute to his ability as a showrunner. And Swampy comes from musical pedigree. His grandfather was a, one of the big band leaders, and he was he grew up steeped in music. So it was interesting working with them because we all wanted to do pop songs, you know, mm -hmm. wanted to do catchy, fun songs. So. Oddly enough, though, my favorite songs were by John Colton Barry. <clears throat> the one Libby just mentioned, I'll Walk Away, which is a short yeah. one that she, she sang. And also the song Little Brothers that John wrote, yeah. which is a very witty satire of a schmaltzy song. Yeah, those were really good. One of my favorites was also um, the blues Song. Those boys are evil. Oh yeah, that was Dan. Yeah. <laughs> when so like Candace, so Candace had, had a reaction. Candace, Candace had an allergy, so her voice would go down. And I pitched to Dan, and he told me I was an idiot. And, and later he called me up and said, "You know what? You were right about that idea." I said, "Get Tom Waits to do Candace's voice when she's when she is, you know." has her allergies it would be killer it would be like like and he said you're out of your mind forget it and tom waits is not doing candace's voice and then later dan did an impression of tom waits doing the voice <laughs> <laughs> yeah. one of the few times when dan said that you know what you were right i was wrong <laughs> <laughs> 
kind of crazy about how things just turn out that you would think that an idea wouldn't work and then all of a sudden it does and you're like man should have listened to you more <laughs> <laughs> well luckily dan dan's a super good singer and he does a really good uh I'll wait for <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really talented singer as well as songwriter. So, mm -hmm. so I would like to also know uh, now that we got the songs out of the way, I like to know about your favorite episodes or your favorite moments from the show. Well, one more thing I should add. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, no, please go ahead. That Danny Jacob, who wrote the scores for our show, also wrote the songs with us and arranged every damn song. Wow! And without him. He was like George Martin with the, you know what I mean? He was like a master musician. Mm -hmm. Still is. He still works on the shows. Mm -hmm. So Danny Jacob would sang the songs, played every instrument and arranged them or hired other people to come in to play instruments. But All without Danny Jacob. vocals, yeah. Oh my God. So Olivia got to work with him a lot as a singer. What was it like working with Danny? Well, Danny and I had a very unique like working relationship as opposed to I would say the other actors because I was always coming in from the standpoint of like being a singer first so he would always allow me to like try things and like write my own harmonies and um and his ear for doing those like backgrounds and harmonies and stuff too was really cool so it kind of was it was very collaborative and we always like would do what we call the wild tracks and stuff for the songs, which I feel like always would make the songs just be elevated and more of that like pop style to where they actually were like enjoyable to listen to and stuff as like real music, not like Disney kid music, you know what I mean? So exactly. he just had such a good ear for like taking something that was like, stupid like squirrels in my pants <laughs> <laughs> and like making it be this like actual really catchy great like hip-hop song <laughs> i think because danny jacob himself is a very funny person too mm -hmm. gets the he got the humor and so the deadpan approach to a lot of the music wasn't trying the whole point of being funny is not trying to be funny mm -hmm. but the deadpan approach really worked in and Danny knew how to deliver that. Plus, he used his son, Aaron, and you. Yeah. Aaron as the vocalist, and his son is a, is a genius singer. I mean, he sings in any style. Yeah, I mean, he really used us to his uh, advantage, I would say, because, like, I, you know, me going in previously and doing like the demos and stuff for some of the other actors like I would s stick around and be like okay well maybe we'll try this and do that and do that and so then it just became this formula of us trying a bunch of different things and he's like yeah just take a stab at it and and I think the openness that like everybody had on the show is why it was so good because it wasn't like no follow yeah. this follow this guideline and do it yeah. exactly how I tell you like everybody was always really really open to people saying well I have a thought like what yeah. if the joke is this or what if the line is that way instead of that way and like nine times out of ten yeah try it and then we'd be like oh yeah that's you know what Liv it goes back to Patricia it's what I was saying earlier about Dan and Swampy being yeah. it, it's all trickle down from the whoever's running the show mm -hmm. So they were very open and they weren't egotistical people. So they weren't insecure. Yeah. Both Dan and Swampy are very confident writers and performers. So they they say, yeah, you have an idea. What are you talking about? What is it? And if they laugh, then it was in. <laughs> now, has there ever been a song that you actually pitched over to um, like to Dan and Swampy and it oh. got rejected for whatever reason? Oh, many, many. <laughs> I like to know. <laughs> many, many, many. You, the you lost get... files of your old laptop. Your old <laughs> oh. <laughs> you can't get, uh, you can't get uh, such good songs without having a lot of them that weren't good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, there were tons of them that didn't make the cut. Can you give us an example? 
Um, I'll send you some later. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> I, I would love to take a listen to it. <laughs> anyway, so I think that you know, there's a, 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 I think there's a. Uh, uh, can you guys talk among yourselves? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go for, I think yeah, a, go for it. Go for it. So I'm actually curious, in addition to like, you know, working behind the scenes with music, have you ever like tried to pitch a song yourself? Yeah. So as the seasons went on and on, um, there were a few of those kind of after hours Disney sessions that I got to sit in on. And, you know, my dad and I had been writing together for so many years that, um, under the Poseidon of just of Poseidon suited <laughs> <laughs> of um of it of it solely coming from my dad. Like there were a couple songs from uh, the first few seasons that were random little ones that him and I had written together. Like the "Mom, It's Your Birthday" song mm -hmm. um, was a a song that we had wrote for our <clears throat> family friend, Mary Jo, who was um, dealing with, um, you know, a bad illness at the time. And we uh -huh. wanted to-, to Well, you wrote that, that song just totally yourself. And I brought and it into the swampy. <laughs> and you guys stole it and made millions. <laughs> and we, no, no, we didn't steal it. I stole it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, there were really cool things like that of just being so close to you know working with my dad and working with dan and swampy playing dan's daughter that i just kind of always had a little extra sort of foot in the door of what you guys were working on and i would make suggestions or you would ask me like what would a teenage girl want if you were working on a script and i'm like well I'm that teenage girl that you're writing about. So like, it was always kind of cool, but um, yeah, as, as it got like later on, I mean, I wrote one of the songs for the, uh, the Star Wars special with you guys. Yeah, that's right. Um, and again, like that's just, it, 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 it all goes back to just the open door. Yeah, sure. Try it policy that I think Dan and Swan. I think you wrote that. At melody for that um star wars song i don't even know how that came about we wrote it so quick and well the, the gag like once the gag was there it was just i felt like it was so easy because then we were just throwing star wars puns in there. yeah 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 that's <laughs> but right it was like okay well we want like a sultry like moody jazz thing and then we were talking about han solo and so we we're like oh so, I'm feeling so low. <laughs> oh my God. So, uh, so I just started playing A minor and a rundown yeah. and then you started singing and that ended up being the whole, entire melody. Yeah. I mean, we wrote it super fast. And then Dan and Swampy had to figure out the timing for when Isabella was talking in the background <laughs> with the plot. And I think that Rob Hughes figured out the timing. I think he did a little demo. I think Rob Hughes did a little demo of that. Mm, yeah, to work out that timing, because Rob Hughes is a is a super genius. I mean, it was just such a great group to work with because everybody came prepared, you know. And I, I did some throwback pictures of uh, our days at Disney for today on my Instagram story, and one of them was our songwriting session for that. Oh, that's very nice. Yeah, I don't know if you could see this, Dad, but it's it's too bright. But like, there you go. Oh, it's upside down. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I see it. Yeah. Wow. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that we go into the into the uh, right, the board the pitching room. Yeah. And uh, and we work out those on the songs. We only had an hour, mm -hmm. but that's that's all as long as it took. Really, was an hour. And that was such a cool thing for me to be a part of and see that that was so possible that you guys were cranking out songs so fast that it like, oh, it stuck with me for the rest of like what I was doing with my own music projects and collaborating with other songwriters and stuff. I would say, let's hold ourselves to that standard and like, let's make a song 
in an hour and it's completely completely doable once you know what your objective is you know well with us it wasn't trying to do it in an hour that's how long it took yeah no but i'm saying just outside of that like it it became a thing that i would challenge myself to do um because i think it used to take me a really long time to write songs because they were never perfect and yada 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 and this and that um but seeing you guys do that like week after week after week after week um it was it changed my perspective on songwriting forever i think we were lucky because um <clears throat> um early on i got confirmation that from other songwriters that it takes an hour mm -hmm. patricia i got a story for you yeah Maybe go for it i got invited to this art gallery uh, by a friend of mine and he he said hey uh mike stoller is here the songwriter, I said, Mike Stoller of Lieber and Stoller? Is he still alive? And he said, yeah. And I told him about your your song because I'd written like 300 songs or so, right? For Disney. And so he said he wants to meet you. And so, so Mike Stoller wrote, was Lieber and Stoller. He wrote all of their Elvis songs. Wow. He wrote, he wrote my favorite song, I think, probably of modern times, which is, Is That All There Is for Peggy Lee. And he wrote um, Stand By Me. He wrote, he's one of the greatest songwriters ever. <laughs> and so he was there. And uh, and, 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 and so I, he, my friend brought me over to him and he was like 83, I think. <clears throat> and he said, how many songs have you written? He was really uh, aggressive and, and very uh, confident, right? <laughs> and he I said, uh, I said, I guess about 350 or something. <laughs> And he said, is that all? And then, <laughs> so then uh, he said, how long does, he said, how long does it take you to write a song? And I said, one hour. And he said, go to dancer. <laughs> <laughs> and then you guys ended up writing a song together. Oh my God. So I said, Mike, do you want to, oh, first of all, how did you write? Is that all there is? And then he, the right, I asked the right question. My favorite song and it's the weirdest craziest song ever and he told me how they how he and his partner did it so then i said hey look how's your health can you come over to disney and write a song with us we would be so thrilled you're one of the greatest songwriters in the world and he did come over and we wrote one of our best songs it's called snow day that olivia ended up singing yeah and mike it, we did it in, and we looked up it was one hour <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. That song had some of the like strangest melodic choices too. That were, I agree. Like, yeah. I agree because Mike did the melody and the middle part. He did the whole song, really, the melody of the whole thing. But there was a iffy thing about the chords, where the chords could go in two different places. So I I made that decision of how to do that. My otherwise, it just was all. I think Swampy doing the lyrics and Mike doing the Swampy and Dan doing the lyrics and and um, Mike doing the melody. Yeah. <clears throat> but you did a great job singing that, Liv. Well, thanks. <laughs> well, going into um, the music, I think that it's fantastic you were able to not only crank that amount into one hour, but also just consistently <clears throat> each song has something unique and different that a lot of people can be able to gravitate towards. And it's not just like, you know, where something you just, you know, pump out really quickly and then the quality starts losing after a while. It's that I think as time went on, when you started like getting an idea on what music you wanted to put down for what scenario, I think that it is able to fit because, you know, anybody who's like saying, oh, you know, you just put music in there because, you know, you're just trying to waste time. Well, in a good scenario where you add music, you either do it because you're trying to explain what the scenario is in a short amount of time, or you're trying to do character development, or you're trying to um, emphasize everything. Yeah, exactly. So I think that what you're able to do with that is just genius. I think that it was just brilliant. Oh, wow, thanks. Absolutely. For, you, you guys like truly you deserve out. it. No, no, <laughs> you, you guys truly deserve it. I mean, there's some people out there that can just crank up stuff really quickly, but 
it loses the quality and they're just pumping it out there. But no, I mean, you guys meticulously did it and you guys knew exactly what you wanted to write for. Uh, what was the situation? What was the melody? And it just turned out great. And I think that that's really commendable. There's another thing I should mention about the songs was that Dan and Swampy and I had the same sense of humor and we had a background before working on Rocco's Modern Life and, 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 and also wanted everybody to have a voice and, you know, didn't, weren't insecure. So, mm -hmm. so they also wanted to do different styles of music because I've worked on other shows where someone said, yeah, let's do a song. And all they do is blues or all they do is some, you know, a certain style of music instead of obviously matching the, the moment of in the play in the in the story to whatever it dictates in terms of the music so dan and swampy loved all different styles of music so we were so lucky there was every <clears throat> different kind of genre but i think what tied it all together was like danny jacobs um danny jacobs plus we had him i mean who would think like we'd get the most genius music producer in the world <laughs> but everything that he did on top of whatever genre or style that you guys were writing and like made it be phineas and for her <laughs> plus olivia i don't know if i told you this i i literally said am i dead am i in heaven because after we did the song within two days the finished song danny would have it and send it to us wow yeah. That's, so, that's that's incredible. For yeah. what we did on <laughs> Hamster and Gretel with Dan, um, like last month, Dad, because um, now Danny's like he, ever since the pandemic, he's been working remotely. So I've always worked with him in person, recording everything. What was it like um, this time? We just wrote a song. Was, Olivia and I wrote a song with Dan and I for the Hamster Show for, yeah. and it's for a. Uh, for Melissa to sing, right? His daughter. No, I'm singing it in the show. Oh, that's right. Of course, you're yeah. singing it, right? So I tracked all of the vocals <clears throat> and I was like, okay, I, I just knew that it was going to be a little bit of a different process because I'm not always used to having to like somewhat mm. produce myself. Like I can do it enough for a demo, but I just lack the confidence in making sure my levels are all good and you know, it, it makes you have to think of a whole bunch of other different things oh, while yeah. you're also performing it. Right. I sent him off the vocals and like within 45 minutes, he had it like mixed and mastered <laughs> and like right. perfect and sent it back to me. And he goes, oh yeah. He goes, I just like, he's like, I just like tuned you like, you know, a, like a half little step in this one section. He goes, Besides <laughs> that, like, here you go. And like, I'm just like, I... And it sounded like night and day from what I sent him to like what he can do with vocals and the production of it. I mean, it was just really, really cool to see him also like he probably does his p part of the process in an hour or two. Yeah. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Well, it takes longer to do uh, the arrangement. Well, I know. Uh, yeah, I mean, he had the music and stuff ready to go. But once I sent him my my vocal stems and everything, he like got back to me like within I would say it takes about a hour. day yeah usually a day but I mean not in that case but that was also a simple song because it just was electric guitar of which he is a master <laughs> bass and drums and vocals and backups isn't that it that is yeah but that is not a simple song I literally like lost my voice <laughs> After track, don't you remember how high that that goes? Oh, that's right. Oh my God, that was so good. The way you sang that, I was like full on like punk rock stadium voice. <laughs> Sometimes after I perform, if I'm doing like not so much on on Phineas, but like days on Adventure Time when I would be doing like battle scenes and things like that, I would just like go into a hole afterwards or like a big singing day yeah we'll, we'll, we'll get to adventure time a little later on because I, <laughs> I have so many questions about that it's so much energy to like play a soul-sucking demon <laughs> <laughs> well i should say happy anniversary to dan the swampy absolutely 15, 15 years cheers the cheers <clears throat> 
Yeah, uh, I guess right, right, right before we wrap up um, Phineas and Ferb and go over to Adventure Time, um, now it's coming back. So <laughs> it's kind of a surprise considering that I thought that Hamster and Gretel was going to be his next big project. And um, uh, when I heard the announcement like about last month during D23, I was like, wow, you know, good for him. 20 new episodes and it's going to be coming out on Disney Plus. You know, I'm I'm really happy for Dan. So um, I like to know. I, I know that you probably can't say too much about it because it was literally announced. But um, uh, I guess you know you probably are involved with the project. So can you like share like a tiny blurb of what's to come? Well, I have one thing to say. First of all, it's Dan and Swampy. <clears throat> so Dan was uh, was always the hands on kind of a guy because he did the animatics and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But Dan and Swampy were equally part of a creative in, in putting the show together and initially swampy was more famous i think because he had the funny name <laughs> swampy yeah <laughs> and both of them are so so witty and so good with interviews what's interesting dad is i think dan was the more hands-on guy with your lane of what you did for the show but swampy was the more hands-on on the production he was our our voice director and the voice director. So he he had his hand in the core of the show, which is the voice work of every single line that everyone anyone said. Mm -hmm. So his his role was enormous. I mean, aside from creating it. Yeah. <clears throat> but it I mean, the, the, all the characters, the names that they have are because Swampy picked those names. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is funny, though, because it's just, it's caught this such second wind with all the TikTok the kids on TikTok and stuff that just like turned Dan into a celebrity. <laughs> That's because Dan is so damn funny as a performer, yeah, really. Exactly. Yeah. I I just love the way that he's able to interact with everybody, like dressing up as doof and schmertz and <laughs> pretending to sneak up to people. And <laughs> then there's also the fact that he answers questions as doof and schmertz. Then he looks yeah. up like weird stuff such as like oh there's this character that looks like my character that was featured in my hero academia or something like that <laughs> um, i was like oh well i mean you know what that's awesome he that finds the most to... obscure things and then like doofenshmirtz affies them yeah <laughs> <And he hears laughs> <Right. them. laughs> Yeah, he, there's this one that he did as doofenshmirtz where he sang the spongebob squarepants theme wrong <laughs> That was actually a pretty good one. And also the uh, times in which he would answer questions from the fans or respond to the fans about like some Phineas and Ferb um, joke or something like that. And he would just like give an explanation onto it. One of my favorites was when he learned about how platypuses are actually green because of oh, yeah, the algae wow. that they ate. And I'm that was that. actually, and he was like saying, we came up with it first. <laughs> Yeah. Really, yeah. It was an amazing coincidence. Yeah. I, I really like the fact that he's able to interact with people like that. Not not a lot of people do. They're they tend to be pretty quiet and they're very private in online. So you know what? That's that takes a lot of dedication. So kudos for that. I think it has a huge role to play in, in us even getting this reboot though. Oh, it's, for sure. Is is Dan taking to the internet and keeping people so engaged and and interested in the show still after all those years. Yeah, especially since it, as of like we've mentioned earlier, it is you know it turned like fifteen, so that means a lot of the people who were kids are now in their mid twenties who are like online and able to share all this stuff and able to talk about Phineas and Ferb again. That it just spread unintentionally to having people say we want more Phineas and Ferb so that's pretty that's pretty good marketing yeah. <laughs> plus I like the Dan uh, TikToks were suddenly out of the blue swampy suddenly appears and <laughs> <laughs> does a punchline yeah I like those and there was one with Alex Hirsch where he oh, that's collaborated with him as Grunkle Stan that's oh my actually... god Alex's show yeah it it's genius, genius. It's total genius. I mean, we were like at the pinnacle of Disney's um, brilliance of her programming. I was so astonished by Alex's show. Oh, yeah. It's great. 
and all the people that Alex um, was working with that spun off into their own projects. Yeah. Matt Brawley with Amphibia and mm -hmm. Dana Terrace with the Owl House. Mike Rionda with Mitchell's versus the Machines. It's yeah, how about amazing. that? Yeah, it's it's amazing. How about, Mitchell's, how about Mitchell and the Machines? Liv, did you see that? Um, I saw, wasn't it a movie? Yeah, it's a movie, yeah. Okay. Oh, it's so good, Liv. You'll love it. It's fantastic. Oh, I've seen it. I thought that maybe there was like a series or oh, something. Yeah, oh, yeah, no, yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> no, it's it's uh, it's great. But yeah. yeah, like it just goes to show you about how um, you like all this interconnectivity of all these genius people just so happen to come together into one source. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me again, you guys. Can you talk among yourselves again? I'll be oh, right yeah, back. sure. No problem. Uh, I pretty much have my Phineas and Ferb questions done. So I guess now we can go into adventure time. So I'm sure you have tons of stories to share about your experiences uh, playing as Marceline. Oh, yeah. I mean, first and foremost is just the fact that, you know, Penn Ward heard my voice as Vanessa on Phineas. And that's how I got involved in the show altogether. So it really all comes back to... Phineas and Ferb at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. And also the fact that you were able to uh, play as this character that was filled with so much turmoil, but at the same time had this gigantic heart of gold, thanks to a lot of factors. And I think that a lot of people were able to gravitate to the character. I have a, a friend of mine who wrote an unofficial Adventure Time book whose favorite character is Marceline. Cool. Yeah. And yeah, I, and also the um, a lot of my favorite episodes involve with Marceline, Simon and Marcy, the Stakes miniseries. I really love the uh, Adventure Time special Obsidian. It was, um, yeah. <laughs> those were fantastic. I think why people liked the character so much is because, I mean, at least for, for me, for playing her, it was just, she's like a walking life lesson of you just really don't ever know what anybody's going through at any point in time and so Absolutely. like for her to sort of start out as kind of an antagonist a little bit of like a trickster mm -hmm. maybe villain kind of character and then to like peel back all of the layers you kind of see like okay why she puts that front on and and why she would maybe present herself that way at first but then you like see oh she's lived like 10 lifetimes where all of this crap has happened to her yes and, and it just just such a multifaceted person it, absolutely it is so life. fascinating yeah. <laughs> and the character became to transcend into a whole bunch of things it, it, you even wrote um uh, a comic book series off of her marcy and simon <laughs> yeah so what was that experience like being able to write your own comic series well, it was really, it was really cool because the first, well, before the comic series, uh, me and my dad had collaborated on um, a book for for Adventure Time, doing the Enchiridion, and then on the flip side of it was like Marcy's Super Secret Scrapbook, and that was really interesting because I felt like I was, it was like her diary, so I mm -hmm. was writing these diary ent entries in first person as this character um so and that was her that, handwriting too and in my <clears> handwriting <throat> and so to be able to dive into her mind on that level of being like okay this it doesn't even have to really tell the story as much as it's just telling like her feelings about it was a really cool way to kind of like right from her perspective and I definitely tried to continue that similar type of tone for the comic series of just making it really really personal to like her like inner struggles and things like that because um, even though a lot of her episodes touch on these things the one thing that she never really ever did was like talk about how any of it made her feel. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah the, the only time in which she actually did was like literally at the last bit of the show and Obsidian. Exactly. And so it was, uh, I felt like I wanted, once she was able to like make that character arc in the series and be more like open and vulnerable and honest, I wanted to kind of continue that narrative of her 
yeah be more expressive in that way yeah one of my favorite things on the comic strip was the song that you wrote take care i really enjoyed that one oh, thank you yeah i mean it's that song's partially autobiographical to me too in a sense of you know talking about all of her different upbringings and stuff and like you know there's definitely a sprinkle of my adoption <laughs> story in there and and um yeah that that in that whole um issue and i think it was number three it was was um it was cathartic <laughs> <laughs> yeah as good music should be yeah yeah, yeah absolutely drink break <laughs> Mm-hmm. The um yeah. yeah Liv Livia, hats off to you with that comic book series. It was so good. And they com Patricia, they uh combined the six ish six comics into one graphic novel, you know. Oh, okay, cool. Available. Awesome. Well, I'll leave a link in the description below for anybody who wants to yeah. check that out, as well as uh your book series, Martin. Yeah. Sure. Olivia's comics all were sequential. So putting them together as a one story and a graphic novel was really cool. Awesome. Gotta love my dad pl plugging the comics, you know? <laughs> it was great. Oh my God. I was so impressed. You know, yeah. what's actually really, really cool is um, <clears throat> my, like my seven-year-old niece, like reads the comics literally ah. over and over and over every night before she goes to sleep. She, That's like, so ah. sweet. <laughs> I'm like, okay, at least, at least someone likes them that much. <laughs> yeah, I did not know that because now that explains what, because she's in, Patricia, she's in a mental institution now. <laughs> Oh, oh my so that probably was the reason <laughs> no she's not, no, she's not. <laughs> it, it kind of reminds me of this uh, one story that i heard a long time ago on twitter uh from somebody named uh at uh it was the uh, twitter handle was at neko ama i think that's how you pronounce it or neko ama i'm not sure if it was i'm sorry for if you're listening to this but i remember that uh, she actually introduced Adventure Time to her five-year-old daughter, and yeah. she was obsessed with Marceline. <laughs> and and then she started like watching the Obsidian series. She actually like started singing the songs, Aww. and it was just the sweetest thing in the entire world. <laughs> she actually like drew a comic strip on her Twitter showcasing about how much that she was obsessed with Adventure Time. And Marceline, they didn't show her like the scarier episodes because she was five, yeah. but anything yeah. involving with Marceline, she was hooked. And I just thought that is the, that is so adorable. I just thought that that was just so that's, sweet. That's amazing. What's so weird about a show like Adventure Time is that like, you really don't know what kind of episode you're going to get. <laughs> so like, it's the exact opposite of Phineas and Ferb. It's like Phineas it's the and Ferb. exact Ferb. opposite. That's right. And, and. As an actor, like, I did not understand Adventure Time at all. Like, the first season... Neither did John and other, the other actors. I right? mean, we all talked about it. We kind yeah. of were just like, I don't know, this is kind of weird. And, like, a lot of the dialogue didn't even, like, mean anything. And they would just say things to say things. And then there'd be complete one-off episodes that have nothing to do with anything. There's ones that are really dark and twisted and... yeah. Freaky and scary and then there's ones that they're just like sitting around farting and then there's ones that make you sob and then there's ones that are just like a, a trip and you're like what the hell did I just watch and so it, 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 it's the exact opposite of Phineas and Ferb because Phineas and Ferb had the formula of it's yeah. what are we going to do today let's do it until the plan foils and Candace tries to bust us and then ultimately that he never knew where adventure time was going to go. And I think that like, it's interesting that they kind of were like the two big shows at the time, because they were just so different. Like, and yeah. maybe that, different. with Phineas, you had this like comfort of, of knowing what you were going to get and seeing how they would make it different, even though it had like such a strict formula. And then on adventure time, it was like, you knew that that like heart was going to be there and that that kind of strung through everything. But like, 
I mean, that. It yeah, was, I think that one of my favorite quotes about Adventure Time of all time came from Guillermo del Toro when he was doing the foreword in the Adventure Time art book where he says, it is the rarest of tales that can be told with the ease of a child. Adventure Time is animated by incredible humanism, one that has the basis in the effortless bromance of Jake and Finn, yes, but one that understands pathos, fragility, and loss. Contrary to Hollywood dictum, the characters are the story and its structure is not dictated dictated by a creaky three-act structure it stays in <laughs> it stays infuriately real by simply being in awe of the world and its characters by being profoundly in love with it all wow that's beautiful wow he really gets it man yeah <laughs> on, i mean that's exactly exactly what he said <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> <clears throat> speaking of uh when we were talking about like phidias and ferb coming back i mean you know adventure time is still going strong we had the fiona and cake specials coming up soon yeah, yeah they do they do i'm i'm excited to see where they go with that i mean i know a little bit about where the story um is is going and it's okay just, cool it's really interesting um it's a really really interesting take on you know this sort of funny fan fiction like seemingly stupid again like seemingly it's the it's the dumbest idea that's so great of like how the fiona and cake thing even started it's just like ice king was a weirdo and he wrote a a fan fiction fantasizing that Finn and Jake were chicks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> really what it comes down to, but the way that they flip it around in in the uh, upcoming special is just like it's not what people are going to expect, which is oh, pretty cool. I'm excited yeah. for it. That's for sure. I I just thought that you know the concept of this is like okay, you're going to swap the genders and you're going to rearrange the story a little bit. And then it just turned out to be a fanfic, or is it? I don't know. <laughs> that's the, that's <laughs> what is that's it? What, yeah, yeah. That's what's interesting about it is yeah. that you don't know. It, it gets you wanting to see what happens, and that's yeah. what makes it brilliant. Well, you know what was for me was the reason. I mean, uh, first of all, it was what Olivia said earlier, which was so strange that she and I were working on two opposite shows. I mean, Phineas and Ferb was a satire of writing, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, the plot repeated, and so we were stuck in this limbo of, of of wit where we had to do variations on the same story over and over again. <laughs> and and Adventure Time was like a free-form... It could go anywhere, so then it's kind of like, how do you rein it in? How they reined it in was because it had a central focus, which was Penn Ward. Pendleton Ward, uh, let me give an example. Olivia said earlier about with, with um, Adventure Time that there were off episodes that had nothing to do with anything. Right. One of the best masterpieces of that to me was Thank You, which was had none of the normal characters. It was like a snowman, a snow golem mm -hmm. who, who was in the winter there who came to life because it was all radioactive or what did it work? Yes. And he found a lost a fire puppy, a puppy made of fire. Now a snowman and a fire being are incompatible. Mm. But the snowman had to save the puppy. <laughs> it was it was uh, Larry like 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 leader and Tom Herpich, yeah, who put that together. Maybe it was Penn's idea, mm -hmm. but it just was. I mean, I'm watching these shows and I'm sobbing like a baby. It's so fucking beautiful. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't believe how profound those stories were because they were such shocking, uh, shockingly original things compared to the satire we were doing on Phineas and Ferb which was more like a high intellectual humor, you know, a, a, where we would make fun of writing itself, you know? Yeah. 
I, I kind of mentioned this um, when I talked about Adventure Time with uh, Fred Seibert a few years ago, where oh, he's he was, great. yeah, he's fantastic. He was very hesitant of the show at first, but yeah. then, you know, some, uh, you know, various people on Frederator was telling him, no, 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 this is a great idea. And uh, yeah, I mean, who would have thought that a show that was rejected several times on Nickelodeon because originally it was airing on the Nicktoons network would have, yeah. you know, as I mentioned earlier with the whole like, you know, Phineas and Ferb came out at the right time for a Cartoon Network. I mean, it came out at the perfect time because um, again, going into like all the behind oh, the yeah, scenes stuff. That. Yeah, the right. writer's strike. But in this case, um, there was a lot of changes that Cartoon Network was going through where they were leaning more towards oh, yeah, live action than that. animation. Well, you know what, dude? You you mentioned, look at, Spinney and Ferb was rejected for 16 years. Of yeah. Pitching. I mean, they pitched everywhere and through different, um, at a certain network, when people were fired and new people came in, they pitched it there again. Yeah. But it was too weird for them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that's both of the shows were like too weird for TV at the time. Yeah. Yeah, they were weird in opposite ways. It's such a strange way. thing, Olivia. It is. I feel like, and I could be totally wrong because I, I wasn't in these rooms, but the, yeah. the way that the structure of Adventure Time like seems to me is that like the writers would just be like, oh, you know what? Like, like they would all just be talking about random stuff and they'd be like you know what one time this one thing happened to me yeah and like personal it, yeah like it was always very personal but it could be the most weird random little tidbit but then they said but you know what that one thing that happened to me taught me this like greater lesson and i feel like that's like i mean the the best song that like Rebecca Sugar wrote on the show, Everything Stays. Oh, yeah. also... I, I love Rebecca so much. She's a yeah. genius. And she also She's like wrote... one of the greats of our time for sure. She wrote, yeah. like her big Steven Universe special also about oh my God. the same scenario of yeah. her, like <clears throat> just losing a stuffed animal when she was a kid, but it like like deeply impacted her because she was just like you know, I, I was so obsessed with this one thing and then I left it and I didn't think about it. But then when I came back, like so much had changed and happened and like, you know, it's just a stuffed bear. It's just yeah. a stuffed little, I think it was a rabbit or something. She yeah, said. it was a rabbit. Yes. And, and that's how the, uh, the character Spinel was partially influenced by when she was designed and then the song Drift Away, where it starts off with back in the garden so going into yeah. the whole garden connection oh wow yeah. really but it's yeah just like, i feel like that's how so many of the episodes and like little character arcs were sort of formed by just these like random little things that happened in people's life and that's what made it so relatable i think because they would execute it in such like a wacky weird way but at the core of it it was like talking about something that i think a lot of people experience so it was mm -hmm. like relatable in the most well fun, let's face it Rebecca, <laughs> if you look at rebecca sugar's old comics and stuff and probably the most the greatest comic ever written which is the thing with the two brothers one of the brothers had a car accident and she wrote the story in a comic like i think it was three pages or four pages mm -hmm. of the brother coming in to try to comfort the brother who's dying from brain damage in a hospital wow. <laughs> and 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 you're reading this comic and you're sobbing because it was so i mean the only way he could communicate was references to the old uh simpsons episodes that they used to do when before his brain damage wow. and, and and rebecca sugar has had a a connection with emotions with which was just so extraordinary. And I remember Penn Ward told me, I said, Penn, what's it like? Because he edited, he's like, was like Dana Swampy. He would edit every episode himself, you know, working with the editor. And he called the editing room his crying room. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's funny. <laughs> you know, and Rebecca Sugar, of course, just like the intense, uh emotion i can't think of a more intense emotion than that movie uh sunshine of the eternal mind oh which, yeah which was about 
choosing to have your memory of your the woman the person you love erased yeah and then they meet again and they both did the same thing and it just i mean it's the most uh, heartbreaking thing you could possibly imagine and that's the kind of thing that rebecca sugar was was keyed into because when she did remember what was it livia remember me remember you um remember me remember the song remember you that, I think that was the name of the episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so she saw an opportunity for the ultimate um, heartbreaking story, which was where the person who you loved, who took care of you growing up, doesn't remember you. Yeah. I think that I, I recall a lot of people when they watched that episode, they kind of gave this analysis that it was like representing somebody who was going through Alzheimer's or something like that, where, you know, they start losing their memories and they can't recall on even the people that they knew and loved. And even with like that one moment where they try to trigger like a memory it's still a blank to them which is yeah. you know like that episode is such a tease because you would never expect that to happen <laughs> i mean ice king is just coming in to marceline's house saying let's write a song together yes. and he, he, she's like what and yeah. then then all of a sudden it take it, it turns a a complete 360 and it's like oh oh wow it's equal <laughs> It's equally heartbreaking as it is infuriating. Because yes, it is. He's, it's a it's a very strange dance you have to do with being mindful of the person who's experiencing it and being patient and understanding, but you you just want to shake them and rattle them and scream and kind of give them a big F you. I mean, there's, there's a, there's a part of her in that scene where she's just like, you don't even know, you don't even know. Yes, like, that's right. Like, ah, you could see the frustration behind her, but it's just, it's coming from like, you have no idea what you've put me through. And here you are like acting like a crazy person <laughs> and I mean, that, that episode was like, it was just, in, it was, it was mind blowing. And I, I think and it was the masterpiece of the series it was, it was Rebecca and Cole Sanchez who boarded it and worked out all that stuff. But because Rebecca had done those comics in the past that made me sob like a baby. I mean, I told you about that one with the brother and her brain damaged, the, the guy and his brain damaged brother. This is a comic book, and I'm mm -hmm. sobbing. What right, the hell? Yeah. How, how does anyone achieve that? And it was the perfect partner, her and Cole, working together on on these episodes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I post that coming out. The amount of conversations that I had with fans of the show saying, like, the way that it was so spot. I mean, I had a father and son at comic con the, the father was suffering from alzheimer's and like oh, no. he was very very clear at the time and like wow and, and on it but like wow. he just he, he was like yeah my son made me watch this episode to help me understand like and, and he's like in a weird way it, it helped my memories because wow seeing it play out that way now I just believe him when he says, just trust me on this and mm. like, you know, you're okay. And like, just, just go with it kind of. And like- so Olivia, remember that in a couple of years when I'm in that situation. Well, it already happens sometimes. <laughs> Matt, and it's, it's not even funny. Like, <laughs> like- I'll have full conversations with you. And then you call me up the next couple of days and you tell me the same thing. And I just say, okay. Yeah, no, I'm I, doing that as a put on, Olivia. I want you to get with it. <laughs> the gag. It's a gag. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's the long gag. that you're it's, a, and it's, it's the satire <laughs> of conversations where we have to do it over and over again. again. <laughs> it's what Patricia just said. Yeah, exactly. I think it's just all old people, though. They like to repeat their stories. <laughs> <laughs> like they're telling it for the first time but but no i mean it's 
that for me was also the turning point in the series where I was like, oh, like, I played Marceline one way up until that part. And yeah. then I played her a completely different way. Did um, you really? I didn't know that. Well, I just had wow. such a, I just had such a different perspective on the character. I mean Wow, because the relationship between you and Tom Kenny were so intense after that where he didn't remember you. I didn't even think of that, that you, that would change the perspective. Wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, even though that it was hinted about Ice King's past, but that was in a, like two seasons earlier in a Christmas episode, but Marceline had nothing to do with it. It was yeah. based off of Finn and Jake watching VHS tapes of Simon going through was, his like, slow change. She was hardly in that. She was no, there. she was, she was yeah, like, she was there, but she was hardly in it. Yeah, she was like at the yeah. end and they were just celebrating Christmas. Mm -hmm. And but it's. It, it didn't actually hit hard until Remember You aired. I mean, they they planted so many seeds throughout the seat, like throughout the series that yeah. just the payoff of just the tiny, tiny little things like the, the Marceline and bubblegum stuff. Oh, uh, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, like, I mean, in Obsidian at the, the very last almost like end credit scene is like you see the origin of the t-shirt and it's just like oh yeah that's right like yes for them in like season three to like set up this thing about the t-shirt and it keeps coming back to that but then it's like well that's why it mattered so much and like yeah it's just and really like cool that they would just take those tiny tiny little little details and then they would like completely expose them later on i don't even know if they did it intentionally like when they were writing the first little ditty but then it was like the payoff would just be so much and so when we were like writing the specifically the Enchiridion and, and Marcy's scrapbook like there was there was so much um research we had to do on yeah. the show and we had to I mean I I actually at that time watched through every episode consecutively yeah me too just right. to make sure that like we weren't missing <laughs> like mm. those key things and like trying to make it as canon as possible to what the show did because you knew if they did something there was a reason and it was gonna like come out later and um adam muto was so so helpful during oh he was time. so supportive oh my god he, he said call me anytime or send me stuff anytime you have a question and he's super yeah. goddamn busy. So uh, what a good guy. Because we had, we like for this, for the Marceline side, I had like pitched whatever random idea like came to mind for me for it. It was supposed to all be during the time of her and Simon's like relationship. He and, made up a lot of stuff to fill yeah, in that. But, but Adam sure. was like, hey, just so you know, right now we're working on stakes. And yeah. so they were at the time writing stakes and he was just like, let's, he's like, he's like, let's like not do any of the vampire of how she got turned, like yada, yada, yada. And he gave me the whole breakdown of everything that was going to happen in stakes. And it was kind of cool because then we sort of came to an agreement where like, I was like, okay, instead of even writing about this we're just going to do a big blood smear across the page <laughs> and, then right. act, and then act like she went on a killing spree or like whatever, like you don't know what happened because she just, she didn't journal through that whole time. You know what? Life. Part of that was the result of working with the book designer. Who's a, also a yeah. renowned comedy writer. John, yeah. John Ted Girachi. Yeah. So working with him closely on that was, uh, it was another perfect storm really yeah because it was like okay how do we go about taking out this big chunk in her life that we want to <laughs> obviously save for the series and we don't want to like talk about it or like spoil anything or add anything there and that was kind of like our solution but it it was sort of um it, it was it was just cool that like the the people were running the show were equally as invested in making sure that everything like gelled. <laughs> uh, we lucked up. Uh, Livy, would you do me a favor? Can you, because I don't think people know the book 
the Enchiridion, uh, Marcy's Secret Scrapbook. That book, could, do you have a copy of that? Could you just show the cover of that? Uh, uh, do you mind getting it? I don't have it. I'm over at Kevin Rooney's house. Patricia, I think it's the best thing we ever did. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool, considering that you and Olivia have worked together in so much stuff. I remember, like, um, when I was doing research on the first interview that we did together, you guys yeah. put out, like, a, a CD from when Olivia was, like, in her teenage years. And I was like... Oh, through Look, age 12 through 20. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yes. That I was like... like that, I think you keep stealing all of my copies. And I have them upstairs. I just don't want to... You know how the... No, no, no. Are. That's okay. Yeah, don't worry about it. It's fine. Again, if you want to know about the book link in the description <laughs> yeah check the definitely get that book anyone watching this <laughs> that book is it's the best thing i think i ever worked on olivia really, really? yeah that book was so killer and remember all the people and i mean to my chagrin everybody said that the second half that you wrote was the best half <laughs> but <laughs> well, they were just two night and day things. Like yes, they one were. was the hero's handbook. And so a lot of it really was just came down to this is how to be a hero. <laughs> and a and a wizard. And a wizard, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because remember, our heroes were idiots, and the wizards really used them like puppets yeah. just to get their way. <laughs> and it was just a unique way to go about the Marceline side and and that was again like I love how in the show everything is just justified by like dumb magic they're like why <laughs> on earth like why on earth would the Enchiridion be infused with Marceline's childhood diary I don't know Hunson Abadir like just he stole his daughter's diary and accidentally like poofed them together he didn't know what he was doing it just like was a, an f up you know <laughs> yes it was really fun premise that Penn immediately said yes do that <laughs> <laughs> so i just that's like what i love about the show is that like you can justify anything by just like the stupidity of it <laughs> yeah <laughs> Like, it literally came down to that. It was like, okay, well, we have two ideas for a book, but how do we justify it yeah. together? Let's just do the stupidest thing that we could think of. So now we get to work on Phineas and Ferb 2, the reboot. Um, it's so Electric Boogaloo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite episode. <laughs> so... Uh, Everybody tune in because it should be quite a trip because we had to figure out how to, I think Dan and Swampy have it figured out. Uh, I, I mean, I made my, Olivia and I going in as a writing team, apparently. We'll see how that works out. I, I, I'm, I'm excited. It. I'm excited. Don't jinx it. <laughs> I don't want to jinx it, but that's how it, that's how it sus looks like it's sussing out. And John Colton Barry and uh, <clears throat> a lot of the other People who have worked on it before will be on it. So. You know what's interesting, Dad? I had a I had an epiphany what? last night. What? <laughs> Just about the 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 reboot and everything, kind of coming full circle of like. What? <laughs> I I feel like since the pandemic. I've mm -hmm. just been off my game, you know. Like I've been really feeling like, oh, you know what? Like I just huh. need. To I need to get out there. I need to start booking some more like voiceover gigs. Oh. During the pandemic, I like really, really pivoted and was only working on like writing projects, you and I, dad. Mm. And I said, I said, but you know, what's weird is that, okay, now Phineas is rebooted. And like, I just had to like send my writer's resume off to Disney to like, try to justify me getting this writing gig with them. And I'm like, your credits are killer. But like, I, I only realized that when I typed them all out on my <laughs> resume. And Your writing was, credits are killer. But I was like so <laughs> depressed because I like wasn't acting as much and all I've been doing is writing and sitting at a screen and like working with my dad, <laughs> which has its amazing moments. <laughs> But it also has its we we butt had some time. And I'm old. Um, but I just like I had like a weird epiphany about it and I said, 
I don't think I would be qualified for this job had I not like spent the last two years only working on these writing jobs with you. So it just like, oh. but it's just so nice that it's now all coming back to the show that started my voice acting career. Yeah, now that's I true. To, now but also, it, so. also get real, Olivia. You did that graphic novel. That's a lot of writing totally on your own. I mean, I was blown away when yeah, I, but I, I didn't do that during, the, I'm saying since like the pandemic, Oh, I did, I, see, that, yeah. I, did that before, I did that before the pandemic and, I, and adventure time was still going on at the time. So it was just mm -hmm. sort of like the pandemic hit Phineas and Ferb ended adventure time ended, <laughs> and then all I was doing was working on like these writing gigs that you and I were doing. Right. Um, and I just was feeling like, man, like I need something like. I needed a little boost in my career or whatever. And so I'm so happy to hear that like Phineas was coming back, but now it's like, it's just, it's all, it's all going around, you know? Well, it's just a testament to, I mean, let's, who, I mean, I assume it's going to happen, but we'll see that Dana Swampy reached out to us um, to work together on this. So yeah. they really want to get the vibe of the first one. A lot of times it's been so long. I mean, Patricia started off this thing saying it's been 15 years. Yeah. So it's hard to somehow sometimes get the same vibe because there's different people. People move on. Sure. But Dennis Fawley brought the same people back in. Yeah. Yeah. So, it it kind of reminds me of uh, the time in which I first heard about Rocco's Modern Life Static Cling, in which not only did they yeah. bring back the same veteran crew who worked on Rocco, but they brought back people who grew up with the show and they were able to have their own unique ideas of how to make it work. So yeah. I'm sure that it's going to probably work the same way, in which I'm sure that a lot of the new people you have grew up with Phineas and Ferb and are more than honored to be working on such an amazing project as this. And they have their yeah, own unique true. ideas. Yeah. And plus, with the uh, Static Cling with Rocco's reboot uh, film for netflix that was me that was joe calling me and and doug lawrence back up mm -hmm. and get, and luckily getting the greatest possible director ever cosmo sergison mm -hmm. to do it with joe so it it, it it remember i was saying earlier i don't think uh, it, it hasn't been emphasized enough that joe murray kind of created the entire scenario of modern animation. Mm -hmm. All the people he hired, he's, he didn't want any sitcom writers or any comic writers. He wanted people who had never written anything before it, it, on TV. And so it was Steve Hillenberg, who later created SpongeBob. It was yeah. Dan Swan, who later created, <laughs> created Phineas and Ferb. It was me and, and a, a number of other people. Doug Lawrence, the head writer of SpongeBob. Yeah. And so... It all kind of goes back to Joe Murray, the whole renaissance of animation for for us, you know? Yeah. Now I would just love for Joe to come by and maybe like an April Fool's Day episode of Phineas and Verb just kind of like animate into his style. And then they're like, where are we? <laughs> I, I, I doubt that will happen, but I'm just saying. Man, it It'll so be like good. a nice little full circle moment in which yeah, maybe Joe, Joe can... Joe is like to you what Dan and Swampy was like. Well, Joe was oh. to you, Dan and Swampy, like what Dan and Swampy was for you and I as well. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. a good way to put it for sure. Yeah. And it's, it'll be an interesting time to like reboot this. I mean, like, oh my God, the other day that we were over at Dan's, like he... Like if, if I am in that writer's room with him, I mean, he's, he's not, it's going to take him a while because we went over to his house a couple weeks ago and he says, it bothers me seeing you behind the wheel of a car. You have your driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> That's because he knew Olivia as a baby. Ah, <laughs> oh, gotcha. She, I used to bring her and Casey, by the way, Casey was also, Casey probably came up with the solutions to more Phineas and Ferb stories. <laughs> than anybody yeah. <laughs> Casey is a and he and I are, are, are working on a a, a a supernatural thriller a novel now yes so, you told me about that yeah so we have to finish that but he used to come up with the story and the punchlines and the, he's like a story guy <laughs> uh but at any rate uh 
I hope that you maybe can talk with Joe again and catch up with where he's at now. He's in Belgium now. Yeah, I tried to reach out to him a little bit ago and I wanted to propose about, hey, I'm thinking about doing this um, big uh, event. And he's like, he wasn't like really interested. And I'm like, okay, that's perfectly fine. Maybe yeah. some other time. So I, I understand yeah. that he's in Belgium and he's really busy with a lot of stuff. So, you know, that's fine. More power to him. Well, uh, that was the last time that I spoke to him. It. So he's he's interested in having a good life now. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't blame him. I mean, <laughs> we, as you know, Olivia mentioned earlier in this pandemic, it's like life is precious, you know. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, uh, I, I was actually thinking about the story that you were saying earlier, Olivia, about like focusing on your writing when you were not doing a lot of voiceover work. It kind of reminded me of story of when I interviewed a voice actor named Spike Spencer about almost two years ago, where the last thing that he was doing before the pandemic, he was going to go to this convention in Australia. But then when COVID struck him, his wife and his son were essentially like stuck there. They couldn't go. Wow. Yeah. And so they ended up moving to Australia. He ended up learning how to, uh, you know, in his time of not being able to do voice acting, he went to culinary school. And he <laughs> And he started learning how to become a chef, and he was he loves it. How life. great! <laughs> yeah, so he was able to find another passion yeah. in a situation that would have turned out to be awful, but he was able to find something else to that he loves just as equally as voiceover. So it just goes to show you that even when something comes at a at a halt and you're thinking to yourself, "What do I do?" You find something else to replace that with and it just becomes a part of you it doesn't yeah. always make sense at the time and that was like that was the like aha moment that i had i was like wait a second like all of this all of working with you and just being typing away like this like it all was kind of leading up for this opportunity to to yeah. like i mean what an amazing opportunity to even be able to like be considered to to, to work on it the the disney show reboot of the century so um <clears throat> yeah it's, yeah it's, it's it's nice to look back at some of those times when you feel very lost and then you're like oh, okay i get it now <laughs> it all makes sense now yeah and if everything happens for a reason I, I mean, What's I see up? that with even, like, playing a character like Marceline, like, the things that I've experienced in my childhood, even though for hers are way more heightened and messed up and crazy and apocalyptic and yeah. demonic, <laughs> but it's like, you know, oh, I'm just cast as this, like, trickster vampire on this series, but it's like, I have so many parallels to that character that um <clears throat> made it be able to be so like real and emotional and so that's just the way life works in general is like you you, you get these things that just align with you at the right time you, you know, know? What, olivia i often wonder this uh, i patricia i told you the story before um that Penn ward came up to me because he and i didn't really even know each other we we would be drinking and drinking buddies mm -hmm. and I didn't know him that well and then he came up and said you know what I, someone just told me that you're Olivia Olson's father and I heard her voice on Phineas and Ferb and it's the voice I imagined for this character lead character of the show I'm pitching now and it just was a weird uh, I mean uh, so I often thought did he did he feel uh, uh olivia's vibe through just the voice in terms of it's just a weird coincidence that all this stuff would happen the way it has yeah. because a lot of times people are prepared for as olivia and i both were for opportunities and and every successful person that i know has has also you work for years and years for no money and then because of the cumulative skills that you you have, you're a valuable player suddenly. <laughs> and when Penn picked her voice for it, it just made me think, wow, did he 
did he psychically pick up something about Olivia's personality and about her creativity from just her voice? Mm -hmm. I mean, I often thought of stuff like that. I never asked him that, though. I should. Yeah. Well, I, think, I think as the stories evolved, there was probably sprinklings of realness because I think that's the way that, that all the writers, like, kind of what we were talking about before of like I think they just like would pick these random little things that happened to them and like from their lives and like go on tangents about it and so um I think at, at the core of who Vanessa is and who Marceline was in the beginning was like oh this kind of like gothic rocker chick who has an evil dad <laughs> like yeah. their, their character breakdowns are pretty <laughs> like spot on and similar yeah um, that's right <clears throat> one has an evil scientist and then one has a scientist surrogate father and then just the lord of evil <laughs> 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 and like this has been a, a theme going on too then i then i booked uh uh bliss on the powerpuff girls That's also right. uh, uh, a, a Science. scientist dad which crazy scientist dad <laughs> crazy scientist dad and then like it's just like weird but i don't know but I think those, oh. you know, every once in a while, there's that one character that is just like, it's what we were saying before of like, some characters are just made for that person. And hey, you know what, you just made me think of something, Liv. Um, we discussed the emotional devastation of the impact of Remember Me, a Rebecca and Cole's episode when when the, the, the Ice King doesn't remember you and he was the one that was your salvation as a child. And uh, <clears throat> oh, shoot, I forgot what I was gonna say. <laughs> I was like, I thought you were gonna get really deep right there. You were I like- was. <laughs> But you know, it's probably better that we don't talk about it. <laughs> I, I guess, yeah, I guess that's fair. I mean, there have been a lot of times in which you just don't know, especially since you're about to have this epiphany and then you're like, oh, but I completely forgot. But it's, it's completely <laughs> fair. Uh, I mean, it, going into what you're probably going to say, uh, I was yeah. guessing. Talking yeah. about the memory say, loss episode too. Yeah, like uh, Simon and Marcy, where, you know, you got to actually see more of the backstory of them. And then yeah. you got to have that connection about like how even though that Ice King completely forgot about it, he he's still a part of Marceline's life. And you got That's to see right. more about this That's is right. how it all happened. So. That's right impactful people in her life and yeah for yeah. him to not even have a clue is mm -hmm. just, oh, it's so sad it's yeah sad. and to think that it's probably like one of the very like i don't know like one or two times in which like i don't know like i have no idea how they were able to do this but it made me cry over the cheers theme song like how do you <laughs> do that Oh how my you, gosh, you're right. How, how do you do that? Like, how? Right. Exactly. It's, it's, it's just incredible. And the fact that, you know, uh, with uh, Penn's, you know, just uh, crazy idea about, like, let's just put a theme song in here and it's going to be crucial to the episode, whether it be the Cheers theme song or the Mr. Belvedere theme song uh, in the Stakes miniseries. And then there was the Frasier theme song and the BMO special. So yeah, that's right. I yeah, know. I, I'm just I'm just waiting. I even joked about this with um, a, uh, my friend Paul Thomas, who wrote the unofficial Adventure Time book. I said, you know, the okay. same. Yeah, he did. Um, oh. I yeah, I'll, I'll send you a link. He actually has a PDF file that you can read the book for free. I'll, I'll send it to you. Holy shit! Yeah, please send that. No, no, please. It, it, he's also updating the book to add in stories about the um the uh, the specials. So. Oh Anyways, God. yeah, he'll be thrilled when I tell him that you guys are going to check out his book. <laughs> anyway, Damn so right. anyway, I told him I was joking about this when we were talking about both Adventure Time and the uh, the specials where we found out that the same guy who wrote the Cheers theme song also wrote the Mr. Belvedere theme song. And I'm saying <laughs> I'm saying, OK, <sighs> and I'm hoping that in one of the specials, they put in the theme song to Punky Brewster. <laughs> <laughs> 
because it was written by the same person. And I'm like, oh, I want to right. hear the Punky Brewster theme song. Yeah. Is that why when we were on Ovid's, uh, when I was on Ovid's, uh, the Ovid Hour? Talk he, show, yeah. Th those were all that he was playing. He he was like, rate these theme songs. And he did the Punky Brewster theme song and the Mr. Belvedere theme song. And I That's was right, like, he did. And I he forgot. didn't like he didn't realize that like that had this whole like storyline. Oh my god, you're right. I gotta ask him about that. Total coincidence, but yeah. Um, I'm glad it came off as impactful as it did because when we were actually recording that episode, Tom and I could not stop cracking up because <laughs> it's so like stupid to us. Oh, by the way, Patricia, Tom mm -hmm. Kenny. Olivia, uh, give me a fact checked. Probably the funniest person in the world. <laughs> we, like we just couldn't get off the idea that there were these the last humans on Earth, right. and they were like, we that. sing this, we sing the hymns of our people, and the the culture must live on, and these like <laughs> as if they're like, uh, like we just were like dying 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 the whole time because we're like what is this job like what <laughs> <laughs> and every time every time like it took so many takes he was streaks on the china and then he just would start like because we like there's like six of us in the booth and we're just like <laughs> sitting there <laughs> trying so hard not to laugh the whole time so i'm glad it came off the way it was supposed to because yeah yeah because we were like dying that entire record of just I, I, it, it kind of reminds me of the story that your dad and I talked about earlier where um, they were telling uh, Joe that hey you're going to voice Ralph Bighead in the um, you know mm -hmm. I in this episode where he finally reunites with his parents uh, I have no son and there's this long just two minutes of him just screaming out never 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 and then i asked him how many takes did that took until he got it right and then he was just like we were just dying laughing it's yeah. like <laughs> <laughs> that's true yeah it was it, it's it's so funny when you get to experience a moment where you just get to see somebody perform and you just can't help but just like crack up even though that you're not supposed to because you don't want anybody to hear but that's that's great i'm, <laughs> I'm glad to, that that experience was uh, just a joy yeah so look livy we've been lucky for sure yeah yeah absolutely. Absolutely. And I cannot wait to see what other projects that you have in store in addition to the Phineas and Ferb stuff and uh, the Adventure Time stuff, like your books coming out, your third one in your series. And I'm just excited about what's to come. And I hope that it goes all well for you. Thank you. Well, thanks. Yeah, and Olivia, gonna... I really liked your Olivia just finished a pilot for Hershen, which is a preschool show. Oh, that's great. And the uh, and she wrote the song for the episode. She learned her lesson well to put songs in every episode. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. And well, also yeah. working on um, trying to pitch a, an original music, music, music based um, series as well. So, Oh, my God, it's so good. Uh, you're going to sell that. I know you are. It might take me 15 years. <laughs> but like we said, if it's a good idea, it will strike at the right moment. There you go. Like, that, yeah. That's the lesson for today. Yeah. It'll strike at the right moment, no matter how long something takes. Well, Patricia, are you working creatively on uh, any series ideas and stuff like that? What are you working on? Well, currently, I'm still working on stuff for my channel, and I'm still working on a few uh, projects, including like a documentary project that I've been wanting to get off the ground for a bit. I'm on the process of recording the interviews, and hopefully right. I can be able to have that out maybe within the next few months. I'm really excited about that. Email us about it. What's it about? Um, I can't say anything at the moment, oh, but sure. um, once the um, final project is in fruition, I'll definitely let you guys know about it. Yeah, please do. Absolutely. I don't know if other people have told you this, but it's 
extra fun talking with you. Well, thank you. <laughs> so a lot of podcast things are boring or the, we're not in tune with the people we're talking with, but every time you've been super intelligent and well-researched and knowledgeable. So I just want to give you a, <clears throat> give you the kudos on that. Oh, thank you. I really do appreciate it. I'm on the back. Thank you. <laughs> Pat on the back. Well, listen, Martin, Olivia, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful so seeing you again. Thanks, Olivia. This thank you. Fun, a little trip down memory lane, Dan. Yeah. So yeah, right before we go, uh, plug and promote your stuff, even though we've been doing like 10 minutes of that. So but, but, please, well, one more the time. The reboot of Phineas and Ferb is coming to Disney+. Plus. <laughs> That's... And we'll be working on all the songs too. Yeah. And um, so I think for me, just the other, the third Hell book with Feral House is coming out. Uh, well, I hope so. We'll see what happens. But mm -hmm. the Encyclopedia of Hell series has been is pretty funny. It's an adult um, sensibility, but still, it's the same kind of sensibility Olivia is with our shows. I think it's working. Yeah. It's not like normal. <laughs> So, what is normal <laughs> yeah so working against that but thanks so much for ha having us patricia really appreciate it absolutely and if you guys want to follow martin and olivia you can check out their works uh their social media outlets uh, are going to be in the description below right. uh follow their work and please give them all the likes and shares and all that good stuff so thank you so much for listening everybody let us know in the comments below about your favorite projects that both martin and olivia have been a part of whether it be phineas and ferb or adventure time or maybe some of their other separate stuff whether it be through Rocco's Modern Life or whether it be through a lot of the albums that Olivia has released uh, please share with us and Love, love Actually yes Love Actually <laughs> more obscure things too <laughs> Uh, I saw the um, the twentieth anniversary special uh, on Hulu, and I thought that that was uh, very sweet. Oh yeah, really cute, was it? Yes, it was. I had it was Diane, very nice. Diane Sawyer in my house. Yes, that was awesome. That was a great was so interview. I say, Olivia, I want to stop by to pick up this blanket. She says, "No, you can't." Diane Sawyer is going to be in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> Not today. I said, of all people that could mess this interview up, <laughs> it would be that guy. Gotcha. Hey, was... Diane, you're wearing a wig. When I pull it, and it's a real. <laughs> <laughs> or are you gonna? Or maybe like during in the middle of the interview, you'll probably promote your book. <laughs> <laughs> Encyclopedia no. of Hell Three. Coming to a near you, Diane. Merry uh, Christmas! <laughs> a great stocking stuffer. <laughs> anyway, well, so Patricia, thank you, dear. Thank you so much. Yeah, really that, thank you. We'd love to got, have you guys back on the show sometime in the future. So <laughs> maybe we'll have our special guest and he'll show up. Oh, maybe we'll see. <laughs> Who is it supposed to be? Was it Dan? Yes. Uh, I, I had Dan on the um, the Hey Arnold 20th anniversary virtual reunion live stream about. Oh, did? Yeah, I did two years ago. It was oh, uh, with uh, Craig Bartlett and Jim oh, he's Lang. The he's fantastic. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, Craig, Jim, uh, Justin Shankro, the voice of Harold Berman. Oh my God. Wow. Um, Ra Rachel Lipman, who was one of the writers, Joseph Purdy. And... You're such a pro, Patricia. That's great. <laughs> well, yeah, and um, my fiance and I had c connections with Craig for many years. So, oh, that's great. He's a yeah. great guy, man. He's fantastic. I, I, we, we love Craig. Anyway, so yeah, uh, all that stuff that we mentioned throughout the podcast, check in the description below. And thank you so much. Take care. Bye. <laughs>
down to the ground. 